Dear friends, one of the symptoms of this summertime is that I have uh, co-workers who have uh, out-of-town commitments with summer travels and all that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, we are sending you new preaching this week in a sermon-only edition of the video. Uh, this will be based on the week's epistle and uh, takes kind of a deep dive into the New Testament teaching on holy baptism. We're glad to have you along and welcome you in the Lord's name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The epistle for this now, which is the sixth Sunday after Trinity, is recorded in Romans chapter 6, and the reading begins at verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now let's pray. Lord, set our feet on solid ground and let your words go with us in all our ways. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, may your name, O Lord, be praised. Amen. In the holy name of Jesus, my dear friends far and wide, our father Martin Luther invited Christians to draw the sign of the cross over their bodies, both morning and evening when you were getting ready to pray. That can remind you of the first time that the pastor ever drew that sign over you in public, likely on the day when you were baptized. We keep drawing that sign over you, you may have noticed. For example, on the day uh, when young people stand up in front of the congregation and make vows of faithfulness and get confirmed. Or we draw that sign every time after we dismiss people, sharing the body and blood of the Lord Jesus at the Lord's table. We draw that sign once again over couples that are kneeling side by side, kneeling here at the altar when we pronounce them husband and wife. Often we'll do it later on in blessing a Christian on a sickbed or in a hospital room. And then we do it one final time when we lay the body of a believer to rest in a cemetery after a funeral. This, by the way, using the sign of the cross is not a command that comes from God, but it is a visible way of making clear that you are not just any old kind of person. You are a person who is covered by the cross, by the blood and by the death of Jesus your Lord. You're a person baptized into Christ who now have been marked with that name and that cross. Believers can forget their baptism, and the apostle here is inviting you to remember, but not just remember it, but to actually draw deep life out of everything that it means. It can help you big time in your daily struggle with sin and doubt in your life. Don't you know, Paul asks, don't you know, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Don't you know, first of all, that your baptism has tied you to the death and the resurrection of Jesus? In my mind, it's actually one of the saddest tragedies imaginable that this biblical truth gets somehow explained away or uh, even worse, completely ignored. You see, there are pious people in the world uh, who try to empty baptism out. They'll speak as if it's just a symbol 
or say it's merely a ceremonial act, or some of them even call it an ordinance. That's a word the Bible never uses in relation to it, meaning it's a law that you observe, something you do to show how you're so obedient to God. And then there are people that wouldn't think of denying the deep meaning of baptism, who, for example, bring young children to a place like this for baptism. On a day like that, they're generally dressed very nicely. They say yes to all the things that we confess together. And some of them will even smile as water is splashed on their young child in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then they'll stand up and pose for family pictures after the service. And then what? Well, then many of those young loving parents who would never dream of abusing young children by starving them or by making them sleep outside in the cold or by withholding medical treatment if they needed to see a doctor, many of them quite willingly, and if the truth be told, even daily abuse them by doing nothing to keep the children's faith in Jesus alive, rarely praying for them or with them, never reading God's word in the home or explaining it to them, and actually choosing to keep them away from God's house where the word and promises of Jesus get sounded so that those children in the course of time would come to think of God's house also as their house. Don't you know, said the apostle, don't you know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him, with Jesus, that is, by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Do not miss what Paul's trying to tell you here. He's telling you that by baptism you were riveted into Jesus' death and into everything that that death accomplished so that it all becomes yours. Jesus' death paid the penalty of human sin so that people could be freed from that penalty. And Jesus' death, having paid that penalty, also broke the power, the hold that sin exerts on people. By baptism, Paul says, you were also buried with Jesus. By baptism, God planted you into these saving things so that Jesus' death became your death and his burial became yours too. And just as baptism tied you to Jesus' saving death and his burial, it tied you also to Jesus' resurrection. The text says that, doesn't it? If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So baptism has grafted you into Christ. And maybe you can recall, oh, from a chapter like John 15, how Jesus describes this kind of grafting when he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. See, a grapevine growing on a sunny hillside is constantly... Uh, transmitting and pumping life and healing into its branches, even though bystanders don't see that. And God's Christ is constantly pulsating his life and healing into you, who by baptism were tied into his death and resurrection, even though people can't see that with the naked eye either. And even though you yourself sometimes may overlook that. This union with the crucified and resurrected Jesus has very potent practical meaning for your life every day. Don't you know Paul is asking that now you're set free from sin? First of all, let me make clear right out of the chute what that does not mean. It does not mean that you somehow magically have become sinless. I'm sure that you remember some of the very basic Bible words that we've all been taught as Paul himself said earlier in this letter to the Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And maybe some of you remember also John's teaching on this matter. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So when the Bible here in Romans 6 declares that you are set free from sin, it doesn't mean that you become sinless. You know very well that time and again you slip and fall into words and thoughts and actions that run contrary to God's will. That's why John told his friends, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He said that because he knew that that was going to happen in people's lives in this fallen world. It happens in your life. And when it does happen, 
You've got this advocate, this defender that you can run to for help, God's Christ. So I want to say it again. Paul's teaching that through baptism you are set free from sin does not mean that you are sinless. And it doesn't mean that you'll no longer fall or slip into sin sometimes. It does mean that sin cannot rule over you anymore. The text puts it like this. We know that our old self was crucified with Jesus in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. There's another place, it's Colossians, I guess, where Paul says the same kind of thing in other words. He says, the Father has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. My dear baptized sons and daughters of God, clinging to Jesus in faith and trust, you're not in sin's kingdom anymore. Yes, you struggle with individual acts of sin. And yes, you may slip and fall into this or that sin at a moment of weakness. But sin as a ruling force can no longer make you its slave. Yes, your body of sin still tugs at you. It still tries many times to take advantage of your personal weaknesses. Whether yours is greed, let's say. In other words, too much attachment to things and possesses, possessions. rather, Or whether it's something like pride and the drive to just look too impressive or too successful in the eyes of other people. Whether it's complaining and gossip, you know, the tendency to be spouting a lot of ungrateful words or to badmouth other people, especially when they're not around. Or your weakness might be doubt and despair. So the pull is there to stop trusting in God and to give in to hopelessness. And by the way, that's a very abbreviated list. Those kinds of things and many, many others besides rise up from this body of sin. And what they would really like to do is to pry you totally away from Christ and estrange you from other people. But the body of sin is in the process now of being brought to nothing. When you die and your mortal remains decay on your way toward being made new in the resurrection, that body of sin will have been completely brought to nothing. But already now, as a baptized believer in Christ, the body of sin is gradually losing its grip on you, unless, of course, you choose to go along with it. Jesus even said that, didn't he? If the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Paul said it once to the Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. David said it already in the Old Testament, in the 18th Psalm, by my God, I can leap over a wall. In other words, I can do what looks totally impossible. So the blessing imparted to you in your baptism has set your feet onto a wondrous path. Don't you know, Paul is asking, don't you know that now you can count yourself dead to sin and alive to God? The marvelous old Bible teacher, I quote him every once in a while, Adolf Schlatter said it like this, sin cannot demand anything of dead people. Well, that's just about right, isn't it? People who gossiped a lot or who drank too much or who were hot-tempered, if you would provoke them, they don't respond to any of those pulls once they're dead. And if you don't believe this, yeah, you can go down to the local funeral home and start whispering provocative things into the ear of somebody lying in a casket, and you'll find out they won't answer. We're told here in verse 9, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Once Jesus died for our sins and came alive, sin's demands and its many pulls couldn't touch him anymore. He was free to live for God. Doesn't have to struggle anymore with sin and the temptations, the way he really felt temptations. Remember when the devil kept coming at him during his 40 days of fasting in the desert. He's now free to focus on his father God, to direct his whole life and find all his joys only in his father God. The life he lives, he lives to God, we're reading here. That has very powerful meaning for you here and now, my friend. It says here, you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's very crucial for you to grasp the kind of life that God is giving you to live already today. I want you to pay close attention. The idea is not, well, you must renounce sin so that you will obtain Christ's life within you. 
No. It's the other way around. You have Christ's life in you, and so sin cannot rule you anymore. Yes, you feel it tugging at times, and yes, you can slip and fall into it, but it is liberating to know that unless you choose to go along with it, it can't rule over you any longer. You can read all about this in 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. And note, please, it doesn't say the new is yet to come someday in the sweet by and by. No, it says the new has come. It's already arrived. And that's why St. Paul never tells you that you have to discover some new spiritual strategy or some secret in order to live a faithful life. No, he points you right back to what God already gave you and the way God already sees you when you are baptized into Christ. We were buried therefore with Christ by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You have that newness now, my dear baptized friend, as you cling in faith to the Christ who covered you that day with his name and with his cross. He counts you dead to sin and alive to God. And you know something? If he counts you that way, it's a liberating breath of fresh air to know you can count yourself that way too. Now, I don't want to make it sound as if struggles with sin and weakness are not real. They are, and they can sting you hard sometimes as they sting me. But as it says here, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We don't see that yet with our eyes, but we believe it because God has promised it to us since the Bible tells you that you were riveted to Christ's death and his resurrection in your baptism. If you and I still struggle, and we do, it makes all the difference in the world to know that in that struggle, you are wrapped and armed with the certainty of Christ's resurrection victory. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? St. Paul is right to ask just that way because you overlook and forget that reality as I do too many times. He's right to ask it just that way so that parents who have lost sight of it and who may actually be shaping their children to lose sight of it can find their way back into focus. He's right to ask it just that way so that you this day can lay hold of this powerful apostolic teaching and rejoice that you are walking through life marked with the name and the cross of Christ Jesus, your Lord. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.